Hello and welcome to our Bare Bones tutorial series where we aim to answer those basic archaeology questions you may be too embarrassed to ask, such as how do I write a Harris matrix? Ugh, I don't know what it is about Harris matrices, something about the web of numbers and lines, but it's taken me quite some time to confidently wrap my head around them. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this which is why I've chosen to tackle them now in the hopes that it might help at least one other person out there. So, let's start at the beginning. Created in 1973, the Harris Matrix absolutely revolutionised archaeological practices in that it provided a simple, diagrammatic way of depicting the relationship between different contexts. Now, when we refer to contexts, we are referring to deposits or formations that have been grouped together due to their similarity. So, for example, a layer of light brown soil and dark brown soil would be classed as two separate contexts. This grouping also applies to when something has been removed, such as when a pit has been cut into the ground and the soil has been removed. Each context we find essentially represents an event in time, and it's our job as archaeologists to identify these events and arrange them in the correct chronological order. This is the point at which creating a Harris matrix becomes very useful. So, when we look at a Harris matrix, we see a series of boxes containing numbers, which are then connected by lines. The box at the top is the most recent, and the box at the bottom is the oldest, just like the layout of the Earth. The boxes and numbers are, essentially, the labels we assign different contexts and our unique identifiers within a particular site. So, if we take a very simple setup, like this cross section of a pit, instead of calling the different layers topsoil or first deposit, we can instead just call them one or four. The numbers we assign are sequential, but the point at which we start our numbering is completely arbitrary and varies from site to site. For example, Site A may start their numbering from 100, while Site B starts theirs from 500. As a rule of thumb, however, the topsoil, subsoil and natural will be assigned numbers first, and this is why the numbers can, initially, seem a little out of sequence when looking at a Harris matrix. Now, in our example, we can see that 1, the topsoil, is the most recent stratigraphic unit to have occurred, so that is at the top of our matrix. That's then followed by two, our subsoil, and we connect the two boxes with a line to denote that they are directly related to each other. We continue this thread as we go down our stratigraphies. So we have four, five, and finally three. Three, the natural, is the oldest stratum, so that is at the bottom of our matrix. The natural is then cut and then filled, and because the cut happens before it can be filled, we know that five, the cut, must be below four, the fill on our matrix. This leaves us with a pretty simple diagram which we can refer back to at any point if we need to quickly look up the relationship of a particular context. So, pretty easy right? What possible reason could people have to dread them? Well, the difficulty comes when we encounter more complex relationships, which is a pretty common occurrence on archaeological sites. On screen is just a small sample of some of the truly panic-inducing matrices you can encounter. Here's a little nightmare I made earlier. I based it on this cross-section. As you can see, we have all sorts of relationships going on. I've gone ahead and assigned numbers to each of the contexts. We will go into more detail about how to tell the difference between cuts and fills in another video, but for now, I'll just say that those in rounded brackets are deposits or fills, and those in square brackets are cuts. I've also made the cuts thicker to make the difference more obvious in this instance. Now, for more complicated features like this, I personally find it useful to picture each context as a different shape. I then see whether I can slide the shape up to the top without it bumping into another shape. If it hits another shape, then it's not next on our Harris matrix. So, from the top, 1 and 2, our topsoil and subsoil, are nice and easy, but what next? Well, 4 and 17 slide straight up. Because they are separate, we can't ascertain which deposit was made first, so our Harris matrix branches out to denote that they are on the same stratigraphic layer. 
These are then followed by cuts 5 and 18. Next up is 6 and 10. Again, because they are separate, we can't tell which one came first, so our Harris matrix branches out again. 6 is then followed by 7. 10, however, is followed by another fill, 11, which is then followed by cut 12. We can then slide up 8, 15, 9 and 16. Because these lay directly under cuts 7 and 12, we can establish relationships with these cuts accordingly. Finally, we can slide up 19. We can also establish its relationship with cuts 9 and 12 because it lay directly underneath them both. As such, our lines merge because fill 19 is connected to both of these cuts. From this point, we can return to a simpler format with 20, 13 and 14. Finally, we are left with 3, the natural, which is always at the bottom of our matrix. Phew! Hopefully that all made sense. I've spent quite some time wrapping my head around how to explain a Harris matrix in a simple and succinct way. And even after all that, I'm not entirely convinced I've succeeded. That said, I'm curious to know what you think. Do you, like me, struggle with getting to grips with these diagrams? Or do you have your own tricks you'd like to share? Let us know in the comments below and on our Instagram at Past to Present Archaeology. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time.